Today's edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Drobo, a family of safe, expandable, yet simple to use storage arrays. Visit drobo.com slash macvoices and use the offer code VOICES100 for special pricing for Mac Voices viewers and listeners. And by the Mac Voices Dispatch, our weekly newsletter, to stay up to date on all the Mac Voices news. Subscribe from our front page or at macvoices.com slash newsletter. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is the Talk of the Mac community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, because we just can't get enough of him, Mr. Joe Kessel is back. Joe, great to have you. Thanks so much for being here. Nice to be here. Thank you for having me. So this time, we're talking about Joe's other series of books. This one is his very own, uh, the Joe on Tech series, and the new one is Troubleshooting Your Mac. Joe, I'm anxious to talk to you about this because I think this is something that I, I don't care what level of user you are. You have this little fantasy that you know what you're doing and you can troubleshoot your way out of anything. And then you find some out of us can. can. Yeah, say some of us can. The guy, sort that, of, the guy that wrote the book can. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, but 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 you know that that's kind of the point. So you know we're it's like this. I I get email. I get tons of email because you know i've been writing about mac stuff for a long time i've been writing for tidbits and mac world and take control people um decide that i would be a good person to ask about any problem they might be having uh, people often decide that i'd be a good first person to ask about any problem they might be having and I, I really do try to be as helpful as I can and as generous with my time as I can, but I really don't have a lot of time and I also don't have all the answers. So this book about troubleshooting your Mac is, is, is a really, it's a rather selfish endeavor on my part. It's really, it's really quite self-serving in the sense that I'm hoping you will read the book so that you don't have to send me email. Um, not that I don't love hearing from you, because of course I love hearing from you. But um, I, I do hope that I will solve some large percentage of problems just with the information in the book, and therefore I will not have to answer quite so many emails asking for personalized help with troubleshooting. Now, I do, I do kind of say in the book, you know, if you read the book and you try the things and you still have a problem... There are lots of other places to go <laughs> to look for <laughs> solutions. I love you, my customers, my readers. Thank you for, you know, thinking of me, but I wasn't I wasn't running out of things to do. <laughs> and I I don't get paid to, you know, answer tech support emails. So with with all due respect, there are people who do get paid to do that. They even do it, some of them for free, like, you know. Apple Store, Geniuses, other, you know, lots of other websites. So I, I try to be very clear about the fact that you can learn to think like a Mac tech. You can learn to think to, to think through the problem-solving strategy the way I do or the way an Apple genius would or whatever. And you can solve a lot of problems on your own. And I, I give, you know, canned, prepackaged solutions to lots of problems. But I also say, okay, now when you get past that to a problem you haven't encountered before, it's totally novel, then what's the hero, what's the what's the algorithm? What what do you what's the discovery process for figuring out the answer? And there's a process there too. And if you go through that and you still don't have an answer, then it's okay. We all we all come to the point where we give up. You know, I there are limits to my skills. Times when I take stuff into the Apple Store, it's okay, but it really helps to know when you've hit that point. And so I try to give you that information as well. Okay, so troubleshooting is a big topic in a lot of in a lot of ways because there's <laughs> there's there's so many little things that can go wrong. I think it's sort of like the human body. It, you know, it's amazing how much a hangnail can really get you know get to you when you know, sure. with all these other things that go on. So where do you even start though to try to instruct people in, in in troubleshooting Joe? Is it is it utilities? Is it like you said a methodology? Well, no one will be surprised to know that I I start off the book with some sort of you know steps to keep yourself out of trouble. Like of course you know you're not gonna 
the, 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 you know, we earlier we talked about my maintaining your MacBook and my backing up your MacBook, which are like ways of preventing things from going wrong. And then this is the book that you you reach for when something has gone wrong, something is currently actively going wrong, and now you want to fix it. Um, but just in case you're reading it in advance of the bad thing happening, of course, I remind you about things like backups and using a surge protector and, you know, preventive maintenance kinds of things. Uh, obviously, I don't go into as much detail as I as I do in my maintaining and backing up books, but I, I have some reminders. Here's how to prevent some common problems. After that, um, I have a chapter. It's really quite a, a long and, and meaty chapter on, on basic troubleshooting techniques that everyone should know how to do because these are techniques that are going to come up over and over and over again in lots of different instance, lots of different specific problems. And some of them are really simple, like how to restart your Mac. I hope pretty much everybody knows how to restart your Mac, but some people don't know what to do if you go to the Apple menu and choose restart and it doesn't. Well, I tell you what to do if it doesn't restart. So some of them are super simple like that. Um, some of them are a little more complicated, like resetting your NVRAM or your system management controller um, or, you know, using uh, recovery, OS X recovery or safe mode. Um, some of these things that require, like, I have to know the special keys that I press when I restart and the diff the, exactly how long to wait and that kind of stuff. So I, I, I talk about, oh, I don't know, more than a dozen different uh, sort of basic troubleshooting techniques that everybody should know how to do. And those aren't, in that particular chapter, I'm not saying this is the answer to a problem. I'm saying... Later on, when you encounter a problem, and I say go through steps one through ten, step three is going to be, you know, restart your Mac, so you better know how to do that. And step four is going to be reset that, you better know how to do that. So those are sort of the basic skills that, again, if you can learn them or at least become vaguely acquainted with them before a problem happens, that will really help you on down the line. So we've learned, you know, the, the preparatory things and the, the basic skills. And then I say, okay, Here's another chapter, an even longer chapter that says, this is just a list of problems. This happened. Here's the steps I'm going to follow. And I'm just going to go through these steps one by one until the problem goes away. And if the problem goes away at step four, I'm not going to bother with steps five through nine. If step four doesn't work and five and six and seven doesn't work. Then I, then I continue with more steps. So there's lots of, because, you know, all, all these problems are complex and it, they might have multiple causes. So depending on what the cause was, the solution will be different. So I, I talk about things like, you know, what if your Mac won't turn on? What if it, um, you know, you have crashes or kernel panics? What if your fan is running excessively? What if you can't empty the trash? What if your keyboard and mouse stop working? What if you're having trouble with iCloud or with your internet connection? And you know, a bunch of other things. So, so for a lot of people, they'll say, oh, well, my problem was, you know, um, spotlight searches weren't working. So I went to that spot and I followed the directions and ah, yeah, that's it. Now spotlight searches are working. So good. And after that, I say, well, you know, this chapter doesn't have all the answers. So if you now encounter a problem that I haven't mentioned, now we get into the real, you know, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what to do. What do you do? And I go through that that whole process. Utilities. Um, we're, we've seen a change in uh, disk utility with El Capitan. Oh, yes. And, oh, yes. And so, you know, that used to be one of the go-to utilities. Is it still? It is. It's it, it's different. Um, there, I, I, a lot of people really hate it now. <laughs> um, I... I would not have made the same design decisions that Apple made. I think certain activities have been made more difficult or more opaque. On the other hand, at a very high level, the, 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 the most frequently done activities are probably easier and more friendly. So, you know, win some, lose some. Um, you, you, you will still use disk utility. In fact, in El Capitan, um, there are some really great things about disk utility, for example, and I, I may have mentioned this in another show, I don't recall, but, but one of the things disk utility can do now that could never do before is repair the disk that you booted from. So 
it used to always be the case that, well, you have to boot from another volume or you have to boot an OS X recovery and then run disk utility because otherwise it's like performing brain surgery on yourself. But somehow Apple figured it out and they, they invented this live mode. It, it doesn't solve 100% of problems, but it can solve many problems without having to reboot from another volume. You just click the first aid button and it goes and it does its thing. So that's really cool. So I would still say that for, for many disk-related problems, disk utility is the first thing you try because it's there. It's free and it does solve a lot of problems. I go on to say that when you one day inevitably <laughs> encounter a problem that disk utility won't solve, well, you go to your old friend Disk Warrior or Tech Tool Pro or Drive Genius, you know, they're the third-party apps that, that go beyond just what disk utility does. Joe, at any point, I'm, I'm not going to. Let's let's set aside the third party utilities. At any okay. point, are is there anything that you can do to your Mac short of obviously formatting or throwing files in the trash and emptying the trash? Anything that you can do to to worsen the situation, to to you know take it from bad to really bad. Absolutely, um, <laughs> I I who. I get email all the time who from from people who have who have made a bad matter worse. Um and and a lot of the reasons that happens is people just don't have a clear idea of uh, you know the 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 internal structure of Mac OS 10 and why things work the way they do. I mean I'm reminded of of Kirk near the end of Wrath of Khan, you know, it's like have to learn how things work on a starship yeah. and then he comes up with the you know the prefix code and whatever and if you don't know what i'm talking about shame on you Amen. but <laughs> hey by the way uh, you know did you hear the news there's going to be a new star trek series in 2017 i did i saw that that's that's very cool my my enthusiasm for the new star trek is only matched by my lack of enthusiasm for cbs all access but Anyway, uh, <laughs> and that will be the next time Joe is back <laughs> to discuss this. Uh, but anyway, sorry. Um, so, you know, like uh, somebody was writing to me about a, a problem that had to do with with um, with photos. And they're, they're telling me, well, you know, and then I decided to whatever, delete iPhoto. I'm like, oh, that was the worst thing you could have done at that particular moment. <laughs> and and I'm just and th the problem was eventually solved. It was OK. But but. You know, there's this there's this thing where a lot of people think I'm having problems with an app, so it must be that the app is somehow damaged, and I'll just delete the app, and then I'll go and install a new version of the app, and the problem will be gone. But that's almost never the solution. I mean, 99.9% .9 of the time, that is not the solution, and in fact, if you delete an app, that can cause all sorts of problems. Um, you want to find out where that app keeps its data, like preference files, for example, and those can be, you know, crazy hidden. Um, stuff like that, maybe delete those or, you know, set them aside, have a backup, have a backup. Um, but <laughs> but um, you can absolutely make a bad matter worse by deleting something you shouldn't delete, by... Um, by going too far, you know, by, by, by jump, like, okay. So like, I know a lot of people jump to conclusions like this app hasn't responded in a minute. So I better force quit it. Unfortunately, I didn't save my work or this app hasn't responded in a minute. I'm going to pull the plug on my Mac. Like, relax. <laughs> so, sometimes, sometimes th things take longer than you might imagine. Um, and be aware of the consequences. If you if you quit a, an app that's running or you shut down your Mac, I mean, sometimes that's the only choice, granted. But but if you do that, um, any work that hasn't been saved hasn't been saved. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I, I think the, one of the things I recommend very early in the book is don't panic. I know that you think there's a very big problem, and there might be, but there also might not be. It might be that the problem just goes away on its own if you do, you know, a few minutes of meditation. 
Um, it might be that the problem exists, but it's not as bad as you think it is. And it might be that it is as bad as you think, but it still has a solution. Um, so I, I, I recommend being calm, deliberate, methodical. Don't, don't just say, well, I'm going to try a whole bunch of stuff. Try things one at a time. Try things recommended by, you know, experts. And, um, and be very scientific and methodical. That is a it is far far more likely to keep you out of trouble than just jumping in and saying rrr, 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 try a bunch of stuff. One thing I think is unfortunate because I've I've been bitten by this uh, until I figured it out. When you do when you pull up the force quit panel and you see an app is not responding, it still may be doing something. It's just Absolutely. reporting that it's not responding. And there's this terrible temptation to say, okay, I'll force quit it and, and you know try again. And like you say, if you just go for coffee or something, a lot of times things will recover, come back, or it'll finish doing what it was doing because it was doing something in the background that maybe had nothing to do with what you were wanting it to do. But the Mac OS lies to you a little bit in that regard, I think. Absolutely. Um, so, so basically apps, the OS X expects apps to send a little, like, I'm still alive signal um, every so often. And if OS X doesn't get that, hey, I'm still alive signal, then it, you get the beach ball cursor and it's like, you know, it shows up in the force quit dialogue as not responding. But sometimes apps are just so darn busy doing something really, really important that they can't take a breath to say, yeah, I'm still alive. Just, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Um, and and if your Mac has two or three or five things that it's all, they're all working really hard on something all at the same time. And maybe, you know, there are extenuating circumstances like your internet is slow or you're doing a backup. And so your, your disc is, is, is having a lot of access or, or whatever, whatever, extenuating circumstances that slow things down. And then the more things slow down, the, the more other things slow down and waiting, uh, you know, certainly greater than 50% of the time solves the problem. Um, eventually the app comes back. Sometimes you might have to wait five minutes, 10 minutes. Now, okay. If you're waiting a half hour and you still have the beach ball there, there's a, definitely a point at which any reasonable person would give up, but, but, but patience is worthwhile. I was your comments about reinstalling the app, deleting the app, reinstalling the app were interesting. It seems like that's something I think that carries over from the the Windows side, the mentality. Mm. And yeah. I also more more not frequently, but sometimes I hear people say, "Well, just reinstall the OS." Again, something that seems to come over from the, from the Windows side. How how dangerous is that, Joe? To to just reinstall a, a new version or a new copy of the OS over the old one. Do you risk losing a lot of preferences? I mean, obviously, you risk losing maybe potentially some work that may not have been saved. But uh, beyond that, is that a is that a, a viable troubleshooting option? It's it's less bad than it used to be. I mean, the 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 worst thing is it's it's going to take time. It's going to take an hour out of your day to to try to reinstall OS ten. If you if you reinstall a version of OS ten over top of the same version of OS ten. Um, then you shouldn't lose any data. You shouldn't lose any files. You shouldn't lose any preferences. You shouldn't lose really anything. It's just that Apple is going to say, oh, here's, you know, the Finder version, whatever. I'm going to overwrite it with another copy of the Finder version, whatever. And almost all the files that, that get overwritten in an OS X reinstallation are going to be identical to the copies that they're replaced with. So it's, it, it's, it's pretty safe. It's relatively painless, but it's almost always the very last step. So I say, you know, try these 10 things first. And if none of those work, then reinstall OS X because it is time consuming. And in my experience, it, it is very, very rare that that is what solves the problem. That only solves the problem if some component of OS X was deleted or damaged. And that is increasingly hard to do, especially in El Capitan because of system integrity protection and so forth. It's, it's, it's hard to damage OS X. So it's, it's very rarely the solution. When it happens, it's not that bad. Now, to, to put an asterisk after that, um, 
I'm talking about reinstalling over top of an existing installation. If what you're contemplating is wiping your entire hard drive, installing a brand new fresh copy of OS X from scratch, and then reinstalling all of your apps from scratch, why that's going to be incredibly painful. And I, I, I really don't ever recommend that. That, that, is, that is the nuclear option. That's the nuke and pave option. I've, I've done it a couple of times, but I, I know there are some people who, who think this is a fun thing to do every year. I am not one of those people. It is, it is harsh. It is painful. Lots of things can go wrong. The risk of data loss is, is very great, and the risk of time loss is 100%. So I, I, don't, I don't recommend that at all in my book, and just, you know, conversationally, only as a very, very, very last resort when absolutely everything else has failed. It's just, it's just too much work. Today's edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Drobo a family of safe, expandable, yet simple to use storage arrays. Drobos are designed to protect your important data forever. Visit drobo.com slash macvoices and use the offer code VOICES100 for special pricing for Mac Voices viewers and listeners. Drobo is my choice for safe data storage, and I think it should be your choice too. But which one to choose? That depends on what you plan to use it for. If you're into photography, check out the Drobo Mini or Drobo 5D. Both connect via Thunderbolt or USB 3.0. The Mini is light, portable, and features four 2.5 drive bays with a total capacity of 8 terabytes. The 5D can accommodate up to five 3.5 inch drives and is a desktop unit with a maximum capacity of a whopping 64 terabytes. Both units have the option of including an MSATA solid state drive in the special acceleration bay that speeds up performance, especially for photography apps like Apple's Photos or Adobe's Lightroom. Or maybe you just want a big bucket of storage, or you're planning to use your Drobo primarily as a backup location. The 4-bay Gen 3 Drobo connects via USB 3. Apple's Time Machine can be set up in a dedicated volume with a maximum size limit that will prevent it from taking up all the space. And if you want, all that space can be up to 24 terabytes of storage. Maybe you need storage for a small network of Macs, or even PCs. The Drobo 5N is a network-attached storage system. Plug it into your switch or router, and you have five drive bays at your command. Different user accounts and network shares can be set up, so each user has a private space. And the 5N can be customized with cloud apps, developer tools, a Plex media server, and apps for downloading files from the internet. You can even get geeky with the Drobo 5N, since it has a quad-core ARM processor. Three of those cores run Linux and are available to developers. Drobo has a developer's kit for developing your own apps, and can support C, C++, Go, Perl, Python, and Ruby. Git has been ported, so you can host your own repo. See, I told you you could get geeky. But you don't need to, since Drobo is so easy to use. All you really need to know to get started is Drobo's tricolored light system. After that, it just works, protecting your data from not just one, but two hard drive failures, all the while making that data accessible on your Mac or on your network. That's something all Drobos have in common. Right now, when you visit drobo.com slash macvoices, you can get $100 off a Drobo Mini, Drobo 4Bay, or Drobo 5N by using the code VOICES100. That's VOICES100. Drobos are a deal at their regular prices, but are a steal with the code VOICES100. Get a Drobo today and sleep better knowing your data is safe and secure. I do. Thanks to Drobo for their support of Mac Voices. While we're sort of on that path, any thoughts on on nuke and pave, and then uh, migrating your data back over from a backup? Is that do you feel like that's right. less painful and right. as as effective? So you know when we talked about uh, upgrading to El Capitan, um, one one approach that that I say you know you can use is you you wipe your hard drive, you reinstall OS ten from from scratch. You know ba- basically installing. El Capitan new on your now blank hard drive. And then when you get to the end, it's going to say, do you want me to transfer data from a backup or from another Mac? You say, yes, I do. And you plug in your bootable duplicate that you wisely made right before. And it copies all of your old apps and settings and documents and stuff. And you're golden. So if you're going to do that, that's 
fine. That's actually not as painful. It's time consuming, but it's not too painful and it's, and it's safe as long as, you know, the backup is really recent. But, but on the other hand, if your goal is to wipe out some hidden gremlin and make sure it doesn't recur, um, you might not achieve that goal because in the process of migrating your old data, you might put back exactly the same thing, the app or the whatever it was that was causing the problem. So although it's, it's relatively safe to do, um, it's also probably not effective if the actual, if, if the cause was something that was backed up and is going to be restored. Which leads me to a discussion of the library. Hmm. Um, how much do you have staking around in the library folder, which Apple tries to hide from us a little bit? Not like they used to, but they still don't make it necessarily super easy to go there, and for good reason. Occasionally, let me just let me just. Do, I'm going to do a little experiment here. I'm going to uh, open this document and search for the word library and see how many times it comes up. It comes up. On one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. It comes up on thirteen different pages. Sometimes multiple times on on those pages. So it 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 happens, but uh, I do, it doesn't happen. Uh, it does, doesn't come up very often, considering the the, the length of this book. Um, and a lot of these instances are when you have a very specific problem, go to this particular location in the library folder or, you know, one of the library folders and do this. I, I will say that Apple has done something kind of sneaky uh, recently. It used to be, for example, that you're looking for a preference file. And that preference file is going to be in one of two places. It's going to be either in library slash preferences or in you know, tilde slash library slash preferences in your user account, those two places and only those two places. And um, it can still be in one of those places, but it could also be in other places um, such as, you know, the, the, the contain. So like library slash or like the user library slash containers slash name of some app slash data slash library slash preferences, which like, Who's ever going to find that? But like a really, really deeply buried place is what I'm saying. Um, but that is one of the places that some apps put preferences now. And so it, it's almost like Apple is saying, oh, you found the user library folder? Fine. I'm going to do you one better. I'm going to hide this stuff even deeper. So now you'll never find it. Ha 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 ha. So... You know, I don't, I don't advocate, uh, you know, casual mucking around in your library folder all, all willy nilly. But yes, of course, there are some some situations in which you'll need to do that for certain troubleshooting tasks. Okay, so the only the, the only thing that's scarier maybe than than digging around in the library folder for a lot of folks is the terminal. Do you yeah. do you send us to the terminal for any of the troubleshooting uh, tips and solutions? Well, you know, I'm going to do a search on the word terminal and see how many times that comes up. This is a new new way to do this. One, right? I know. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times. So not that many. Um, and, and most of these are, again, for really specific things. Like, you know, you, you right click or, you know, control click or double tap on something, a, a file, and you go to the, the contextual menu, and then there's an open with submenu. And this lists all the different apps that can open this file. And sometimes that, that menu is wrong. Like it doesn't contain an app that you know can open that file, or it contains like three or four copies of some app. So when that open, in, open with menu has errors, there's this procedure that you have to go through to fix it and use terminal to use that to do that procedure. But it's like a very specific thing. So you know, I like the command line. I wrote a book about the command line. I get along just fine with terminal. But as is the case with all of my books, this is not written for geeks. This is not written for a technical audience. It's written for ordinary folk. And I, I, I want to respect the fact that dealing with terminal is, is a little bit geeky. And it's not something that I just want everybody to feel like they have to do all the time. 
It's something you do in very specific situations. You get in, you do your thing, and you get out, and that's it. At the risk of doing a crossover between books, um, I, we talked about you talked about Tech Tool Pro, uh, Drive Genius, Disk Warrior, mm -hmm. uh, the the usual what I kind of consider serious, very specific troubleshooting and, and resolution utilities. How yep. about how about some of the maintenance utilities? Um, if you're having a problem, do you do you advocate running something like Cocktail or Onyx on a machine to try to solve a problem or is that really just more of a maintaining your Mac kind of thing? No, it's more of a maintaining your Mac kind of thing. Um, there are, you know, there are some specific situations like if you're running out of disk space, but you don't know why you're running out of disk space, there's a bunch of utilities that will tell you, you know, where, well, what are your largest files and where are they located? And oh, by the way, would you like me to delete some of these for you? Um, if you're running out of disk space because for some reason you have a lot of duplicate files that you don't need two copies of or more than two copies of, there are apps that will find those and delete those for you. So in, in cases like that, sure, there are utilities that can help you, but um, I do talk about disk space in the maintaining book because I think of it more as a, more as a maintenance issue. If you've gotten to the point where you have three megabytes of disk space left, obviously, yes, it becomes a troubleshooting issue, but that is also not the moment where you're going to go download a utility to solve that problem. So um, that is one of those things that is, is probably better solved preventively. You already answered this, but I'm going to ask it again. Um, okay. the, who is the book for? It's, it's obviously for not heavy technical people. It's for people that maybe are just getting into troubleshooting. Um, any, any other category of, of readers that you think would benefit from this book? Yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a book for people. The, the way I think of it is people who don't really enjoy tinkering with computers that's not that's not a fun pastime for them. They really don't want to know how everything works. They just want to get their work done. And they encounter frustrations from time to time because apps crash and things go wrong and they're busy. Busy people don't want to spend hours researching a problem on the web, more hours making an appointment at a repair shop or an Apple store and taking in a Mac and having a genius look at it. Busy people who are not, you know, of, of a geeky disposition just want to solve problems and get back to their work. And so for people like that, spending 10 bucks on a book that has many of those answers right in it, they don't have to waste time, they don't have to go anywhere, um, and they don't have to wonder, you know, am I reading up-to-date advice? Because you don't always know on the web and is this expert advice or is this just some guy's opinion? Well, this is expert advice, which you can't always know on the web. I mean, it's not just me. I mean, you know, Dan Frakes did a tech review of the book. Um, his, his technical chops are unimpeachable. And, you know, this is stuff that ha most of it has, has really proved the test of time. It's been, these, these steps have been uh, out there for for quite some time, either, you know, in this book's predecessor or something else that I've written. And um, they are they are reliable. I, I don't promise to solve every problem, but you, you can count on the advice in this book. So I, I would say busy people who, who just want to get their work done. Joe, something we've never talked about, I don't think, we've, we've, we've mentioned it in passing plenty of times, but, but I'm going to ask you to elaborate on it. Um, because you're right, Dan Frakes is is impeccable when it comes to it. Explain what a tech edit is, because you 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 do tech edits for your books. Obviously, they're done for take control books. I don't think a lot of people completely appreciate all the processes that go into making sure that the information that they're getting has a lot has unimpeachable quality behind it. Right. So, I am for for people unfamiliar with the publishing process. There are there are a number of different kinds of editors. So um, some books and some publishers have development editors, and development editors do things like helping the author to to create a good outline and making sure that the overall flow of information is good and useful and makes sense. 
Um, they're they're helping to develop the the flow of the book and the overall concept of the book. And make sure it, is this a marketable title? Is it right for our audience? Those sorts of things. Um, then there are sort of various lower levels. Um, there's there's copy editing, which can can be everything from you know looking for grammatical mistakes and misspellings and and typos and poor usage of punctuation to adhering to a particular style guide. I mean, my books have their own style guide. Take Control books have their own style guide. They're different from each other. To fact-checking, um, to saying, you know, I get what you're trying to say here, but it just isn't worded very clearly. Or um, I, I think a more effective way to, 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 to express this would, would be in a different order or, you know, reword this paragraph or get rid of this topic and put a screenshot here. So, um, so a, a copy editor, depending on, again, the, the publisher and, and how the division of labor is, can do all those sorts of things. Then a tech editor or a tech reviewer has a very specific job, which is to make sure that the author is telling the truth. So the tech reviewer's job is to say, well, uh, the author says, go through steps one through five. I'm now going to perform steps one through five on my computer, exactly as they're written in this book, and make sure they do what the author claims they're going to do. Um, so, so basically, the role of, uh, of, a, of a tech reviewer is to make sure that the author is telling the truth um, and, and not telling you anything that will be harmful um, in, in, in the technical details. The tech reviewer isn't going to worry about grammar, not going to worry about layout or any of that kind of stuff. It's just going to be, are these facts correct based on my background, my experience? Now, I have, I have been the tech editor on various books that other people have written. Um, I can't be the tech editor of my own book because I'm always going to miss something or forget something or something that works fine on my computer won't work correctly on somebody else's computer. And then they'll point that out and be like, oh, of course. Well, under these circumstances, I would have to give different directions. So that's the job of the tech reviewer is to point out any, anything that I might have missed, anything that um, it's like, oh, well, I can't believe you didn't give a tip about how to do this in this particular situation. This is a really great additional fact that, that readers should know. So those, those sorts of things. And I especially wanted to make the point when you mentioned Dan. Um, I know we've we've talked about a lot of the editors, the tech editors um, for Tech Control Books, but you know the Joe on Tech Books also have tech editors, um, and those are the people that make sure because I mean it's your book, but you you have somebody backing you up and fact checking you as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So the book is the Joe. It's it's Joe on Tech. Um, how do we get it? Where do we get it? What's it cost? All those all those facts. Yes. So you can go to joeontech.net. Uh, if you go to joeontech.net slash books, then you'll see all the Joe on Tech books as well as some of my Take Control books. Um, but there are, you know, it's a website. There are links. You can <laughs> just go to joeontech.net. You'll figure it out. Anyway, the book is called Troubleshooting Your Mac. It's $10, bucks, uh, nine ninety nine, if you will. Um, and you can buy it from me directly. I would love it if you bought it from me directly, because if you do that, then I make more money than if you buy it from, let's say, Amazon or the iBook store or Take Control or wherever. You can buy it all those places, and that's fine, but I get more money if you buy it from me directly. Um, it's available in paperback as well. The paperback edition is 15 bucks because, you know, trees. But um, so paperback, 15 bucks, ebook. Ten dollars as usual. It's in you know PDF and EPUB and Mobi format, so you can read it on any device. And um, it's you know if you buy it, if you had the older version of the book, if you had Take Control of Troubleshooting Your Mac, which was you know became outdated a few years ago, and this is sort of a replacement for that, with, which is very 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 much updated. Um, if you had the old Take Control book, then again, you can click uh, the, the Check for Updates link on the cover and you'll be taken to a page that explains how to get a discount from Take Control on the new book. So, uh, you know, I like to take care of my customers just as uh, Take Control does. I, I think I'm offering uh, a pretty reasonable price for a lot of really good and useful troubleshooting advice. 
Yeah, this feels like one of those books that it's not going to be a book you necessarily read. It's going to be a book you refer to um, unless you're really into troubleshooting. And then, you know, and and won't this look handsome on your bookshelf? I mean, I, I love the purple. I mean, gel. come on, thank you. Yeah, I, yeah. The, well, the, you know, I kind of have a <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, so you know, real a real paper, you know, book. And oh, would you look at that? Um, <laughs> I, I'm going to put this in my bathroom and read about Mac triple shooting when I don't know. Anyway, uh, but yeah, this is this is something that I think. I mean, I'm really I'm really quite proud of this book, and I think it's it, even if you don't buy the backing up your Mac and the maintaining, this is a great thing to just have on hand because look, things will go wrong, and just knowing that there is a pretty good chance that the solution to the thing that's gone wrong is in this book should give you some comfort, and it's a nice thing to have on your shelf. Makes a great holiday gift too. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. says Santa Joe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I I think this book is going to be one of those like uh, like Tech Tool Pro, like uh, Drive Genius, like Disc Warrior. They're the kind of things you you buy, you put on the shelf. You don't want to wait until you, something has gone wrong to try to download them or buy them and figure it, figure it out. Um, you want to be able to pull pull it out, plug the the uh, the stick drive in and and fix it so you know by all means so it's joe on tech let's see i gotta do the the uh, the kind of the, the, the cock of the head joe on tech dot net dot net yeah that's right <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. yeah uh yeah we'll get that down yeah, yeah. um and it is uh troubleshooting your mac that's right joe thank you thank you so much again thank you for uh, for all the effort you put into it i i think you're going to educate a lot of people hopefully make their lives a little bit easier in a moment of crisis that is certainly what i hope to do we will see you again very soon. Absolutely. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Voices. We hope to see you again soon because we've got more great stuff coming up as we uh, start the, the countdown to 2016. Until the next time, thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for links, show notes, to subscribe, to connect with Chuck on Twitter, Google+, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and the Mac Voices blog. Subscribe to our weekly newsletter, the Mac Voices Dispatch, to stay up to date on all the latest Mac Voices news from our front page or at macvoices.com slash newsletter. Do more with your Apple tech by subscribing to the free Mac Voices magazine on Flipboard by visiting macvoices.com slash magazine. Advertising and sponsorships handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com.